Wow, what a topic to follow. Um, I don't usually read everything, but in the interest of time, bear with me as I stick my head far too often in the text. I want to start off with a quote from Hamlet, uh, Day and Night, This is Wondrous Strange, and therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. The siege begins with what is perhaps a dream of Africa. The storyteller sings to camera, and he'll continue throughout this prologue of orphanages and hospitals and the propaganda activities of an unspecified military regime. A woman cycles along a road that leads to a primary school where a man teaches a lesson about the difference between a boss and a leader. Almost instantly, the lesson is interrupted by just such a boss, bursting into the classroom with a posse of soldiers who rough handle the teacher and take him away. This happens before the eyes of the woman who breaks down in anguish beside the storyteller. He walks by, still singing, and is seemingly indifferent to her trauma. The same woman, Shandurai, Tandy Newton, wakes as if from a disturbing dream. Very gradually, depending on your familiarity with the city and how much of a stranger you are, it becomes clear that the action is now set in Rome. Shandurai is a medical student who lives in the basement of a house on the Vicolo del Bottino of the Piazza di Spagna and its tourist famous Spanish steps. Shandurai cleans house for a man, Mr. Kinsey, David Thwellis, a talented pianist and composer. The two perform a sort of cat and mouse routine up and down the Hitchcockian spiral <coughs> staircase of this house. Their ballet is accompanied by their competing musical expressions, that is, Shandurai's uh, African and African influenced CDs for Kinsky's piano compositions and by Shanjirai's intermittent, ambivalent dreams of the Africa she has left behind. Kinsky frustrates and disturbs Shanjirai through the apparent unintelligibility of his music and by sending her gifts, a piece of music manuscript paper with a single question mark on it, an orchid and a ring. As her medical studies and her cleaning duties continue, finally and awkwardly, Kinsky declares his love for her only to discover that she's actually married and that her husband is a political prisoner in East Africa. Pathetically, he offers to do anything for her, even to take her back to Africa. And she responds to this suggestion um, with a discomfort uh, and to the and sort of reflecting her disdain for her host's kind of lack of perspective when she says, what do you know of Africa? Finally, she screams at him in frustration, you get my husband out of prison. Amongst the discomfort of their main age thereafter, unbeknown to her, he sets about doing just that. He seeks intelligence and help from a local African priest, Cyril Nri, while she begins to notice that there are increasingly fewer of his statues and works of art to dust. As it becomes clear to her what is happening, she develops an admiration for his music and indeed for Kinsky himself. Eventually everything in the house that's not nailed down has been sold, including his precious piano, and Shandurai hears from her husband Winston that he is arriving in Rome the following morning. Both Kinsky and Shandrai get drunk separately that night, but end up by sleeping beside one another in the same bed. Kinsky wakes to find a note from Shandrai declaring her love for him, and she wakes to the sound of the doorbell being rung repeatedly by her husband who is standing in the vicolo. At length, Shandrai leaves Kinsky's bed, and the film ends with her husband Winston waiting at the door as the first metro passengers emerge from the station to begin their working day. Before we know anything about Shanjirai, we know that she, uh, uh, and before um, she, before we know that she's a cleaner, uh, sorry, one who works, as Julie Christava would think of her, a not uncommon occupation for an East African woman in Rome in the 90, or after the 1980s, we notice and we, are, we see her first as a medical student in the course of the film, we discover that despite a kind of a cliché toughness of the Italian medical examination boards, Chandroy is an A student, 
We also note that she speaks at least three languages. What stands out amongst these notions of Shandarai's identity as a black African extra comunitaria um, is Bertolucci's assertion of her extremely powerful point of view. Not only is she highly accomplished, but this point of view, which is represented by the complexity of her emotional ambivalence over her past and present, makes an important point. It impresses upon the audience that Shandarai possesses a powerful subjectivity that is not to be reduced to the stereotypes of foreign and racial othering. In short, she is not a foreigner, not an alien, nor someone who can be dismissed as from beyond the community, extra comunitaria. From the perspective of this particular Italian response to the country's historical immigration experience, Shangirai exhibits a familiar ambivalence and is therefore nothing more or less than simply a human being. Let me say something about the kind of terms of ambivalence that I'm drawing upon in this paper. Recent studies in uh, the social sciences addressing people movement within and between Africa and Europe have made much of the notion of ambivalence. In this context, ambivalence covers a range of experiences but largely clusters around personal struggles over freedom and guilt relating to home and family obligations. It also relates to a more politically experienced ambivalent citizenship, negotiating hegemonies not only by the obligations towards home and family left behind, but also within new host communities. Although a much more privileged experience, and I'm thinking here of Eat, Pray, Love, the concept of lifestyle or quest migration away from the developed world also raises various encounters with ambivalence. These relate to the clash between what scholars have called the desire for elsewhereness of economically empowered migrants who might be regarded, uh, who might be regarded as their experience of too much elsewhereness. The narrative fictions that we are considering touch upon much of the migrant experience as observed and analysed by sociologists. The extent to which creative art forms express heightened emotion and psychological realities, however, leads us to consider a certain strain of psychoanalytic discourse in order to account for the representation of a core emotional ambivalence with the experience of fictional migration characters. Considering Freud's various discussions of ambivalence, particularly as raised in the mythologies of totem and taboo, and qualifying and extending these with uh, Julia Kristeva, who, if you've been following the papers, has been recently considered as something of a, um, a spy, <laughs> um, which, of course, she denies. Um, uh, she might be. Yeah, I kind of better be sick. <laughs> um, however, you know, uh, I'm drawing here on the mediation of the ambivalent stranger foreign exile in her um, fantastic book, Strangers to Ourselves. So what we're doing with this material is establishing a kind of a parallel narrative, the idea is, to assist us in accounting for the representation of the Janus-like migrant subjectivity, which we see at the heart of the narrative fictions that we're considering. In the context of psychoanalytic notions of ambivalence, this is de Freud particularly deals with ideas such as mourning, obsessional neurosis, dare I say it, mothers-in-law, uh, melancholia, the uncanny, um, and sort of general child-parent relations. And I think we can read migrant experience through these um, in a number of different ways. In incredibly brief summary, I'll talk about uh, just some of them very quickly. This um, idea of a reluctant extrication from trauma, the redefinition of ambivalent home and family relations, am ambivalence felt towards a host, obviously that of the host community towards the stranger. In the traumatic but sad necessity of original flight, the delicious maintenance of loss from exile and the mutual trade in stranger host hostility and admiration, the result of all this ambivalence is an eradication of borders against the exchange between the stranger as other and the stranger as self. Calling up the dialectics of master and slave, as well as an array of historical, political and linguistic examples of the welcome stranger, 
the foreigner as citizen and the outsider as insider, Kristeva demonstrates the legitimate place of the strange other within the familiar body politic and cosmopolitan civility. The mutual recognition of ambivalence is also the mutual recognition of biography, particularly of the host for the stranger's biography. And it's at this point of recognition that, as she says, every native feels himself to be more or less a foreigner, and that the ongoing hunt for foreigners in our society is pointless without acknowledging what Christava sees in Freud, a lesson about how to detect foreigners in ourselves. So Bertolucci has spoken of the film's lack of dialogue and how that makes it resemble not only a musical but also a silent film. A seven minute dialogue free sequence about halfway through the film provides us with a useful example of the way in which Bertolucci uses everything but the spoken word to express Shandurai's point of view um, and her experience of a very deep personal kind of ambivalence about her situation. And I'd like to uh, invoke the help of YouTube here to show uh, something of this um, sequence. Is that visible? And yeah. Okay. 
that he uses at the end to complete what he started before the dream. So whatever their lingui linguistic competence in a new country, the migrant knows the frequent la a relief of a lack of speech. In the moments of wordlessness, there can be no chance of miscommunication. Such moments also provide a welcome oasis of time for reflection, which always takes place, I think it always takes place in the mother tongue. The brief mo moments of the removalists at work at the beginning of this scene echo Shangirai's general um, experience as a kind of heightened, uh, of a kind of heightened jet lag unease rendered by Ber uh, Bertolucci's diverse camera regime, his decor, editing, and sound strategy throughout the film. Hitherto, such moments have left very little space or leisure for the presence of Africa amongst her reflections. Once she has this space, the discovery of the envelope allowing her an opportunity for a degree of optimism, her dream creates a nostalgic fantasy, balancing contradictory ideas, as the work of nostalgia always does at its best. The African storyteller is no longer an archaic, detached presence, but an intrusive and threatening irritant. Shangirai's political activism is a dream is liberating, but it's confused and challenged by the emotionally undermining effect of the presence of Kinski, or someone who looks like Kinski, in the poster, accordingly cast here not as her benefactor, but as her oppressor. The African land and waterscape endures in her mind as a calm and quiet, timelessly beautiful scene. Chandra's waking response to the dream, which we haven't had a chance to see, is merely the restatement of her powerful ambivalence. The entire sequence can be read as the emblematic portrait of any African woman or man in Rome, the mysteries of whose, whose unconscious are as palpable as those confronting the spectator through Bertolucci's narrative strategy and its explicit cultivation of ignorance and doubt. If the foreigner can be jet-lagged, confused, uncomfortable and ignorant, we, the film's audience as host, can understand all these experiences because through Bertolucci's formal expression, we experience them too. The strategy of empathy also puts other aspects of Shangirai's port portrait into greater focus. Her experience of Rome and Italy is no simple engagement of a foreigner with a smug and culturally homogeneous and unified host nation. Primarily, that encounter is not some sort of immigrant standoff between alien and nation, but is localised and personalised overwhelmed and dominated as it is by her encounter with Kinski. White and apparently wealthy, Kinski has the status of padrone. Just as she sees him as a dictator in her dreams, Shangirai clearly approaches Kinski with all the subordinate deference that inevitably leads to the potential for oppression to exist in their relationship. 
This is certainly a characteristic that he clearly displays in his physical and emotional awkwardness towards her. It's also a characteristic she perceives in him through the puzzling emotional assault of his unassailable goodwill and patronage. And yet, as an Englishman with a non-Italian Central European name, Kinski himself is a foreigner. He may have literally disposable wealth and a certain apparent ease in his place in the city and the possession of a certain leisure that Christopher sees as the birthright of the second generation foreigner, but unlike Shanjirai in this film, he has no friends. Living alone and spending most of his time in his kind of Bertoluccian gabinetto, <laughs> he is really the real clandestino. So, to the extent that Kinski is Shanjirai's most significant encounter with Rome in the person of Kinski, we see that the hosting presence, the dominating encounter with a local potentate, is an encounter with one who is, in effect, no more local than she is. By the end of the film, his relinquishment, as Bertolucci calls it, of his movables, he covets something of the material condition of the trauma-fleeing migrant. He may have lived there all his life for all we know, or need to know. As in the example of Shanjirai's friend and fellow student Agostino, who is the only real Italian, can I use that word, primary in the film, constantly, he constantly reminds us of his sexual marginalisation. Bertolucci's portrayal of the foreign experience shows that no one is a local. For all of us, our capacity for estrangement and alienation is not only viable in the practical world, but through the fact of it being psychologically constitutional it is inevitable. Sanjirai's host encounter is no more characterised by ambivalence than her encounter with her sense of home and origins. If multiculturalism may be defined as the political self-expression of equal loyalties for one home and one's adopted country, it could easily be defined, in, as it is in this film, as a sort of equal treachery. The film's associate producer and co-screenwriter Bertolucci's partner, Claire Peplo, has commented on Shanjirai's suppression of her own past. Peplo has also pointed out the narrative delay she contrived early in the film to keep the audience in some doubt as to the nature of her relationship with the arrested teacher who will inevitably be revealed to be her husband. Shanjirai's single encounter with her fellow Africans in the film is unsatisfying to her and provides her no comfort after the shock of Kinski's amorous declaration. <coughs> in conclusion, her dreams of Africa display its substantial beauty, but these brief images do nothing to eradicate the powerful and enduring images of the trauma and violence she experienced there. Shanjirai has fallen in love with Kinski through an acquaintance with his art, and in particular, for his selfless act of kindness on her behalf. As she hesitates to rush to the front door to greet her newly released husband, Winston, her reluctance is as much motivated by a repulsion for what stands as home in her mind as a newly minted affection for her new or current home. In this romantic moment of hesitation, we see her as proudly defying traditional migrant stereotypes. Shanjirai, perhaps unlike Kristeva, is neither agent of a foreign power, read terrorist, nor the seeker of first world welfare and beneficence, read economic migrant. Fleeing trauma and journeying endlessly towards sanctuary, ambivalent and ill at ease in both states, Shanjirai is a stranger. What Bertolucci's film shows us is that the, in the ambivalence we experience with her, we are strangers ourselves, therefore we should make her welcome. Thanks. Yeah.